Well, all right. Well, good morning. Um, thank you so much for being here. My name is Justin Clark. I'm the Digital Initiatives Director for the Indiana State Library. I'm very happy to be here today um, and to kind of share with you how we have um, enhanced our digital collections through Wikipedia and Wikimedia Commons, both through just work on Wikipedia and Wikimedia Commons, as well as events that we've hosted here over the last few years. But to give you guys some background who may not be here from Indiana or, 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 is, or always as related to Indiana collections, um, I want to tell you a little bit first about um, uh, Indiana Memory and Hoosier State Chronicles and what they are. They're the two major digital initiatives um, that I run at the Indiana State Library. Um, our digital initiatives division was launched in 2007, and a year later, we launched Indiana Memory, which is our statewide repository for Indiana's cultural heritage. We work with libraries and institutions all across the state to do this digitization work. And to date, we have well over 170 partners, um, over 730 collections, and nearly 700,000 items related to Indiana or Indiana-based institutions available online. Most of these are, are made available online through ContentDM, which is our content management system for these materials. Um, but we do also um, harvest from other non-ContentDM sources, like Past Perfect. So some of you might be involved in museums. Um, well, museums are ones that, especially small museums, like house museums or county museums, use Past Perfect to do cataloging of their materials. And then from there, they can actually be made digitized, especially if they um, do photographs of their materials at their local institutions um, alongside their metadata. And, uh, and so we've been doing this work for a number of years. We're very proud of the work that we've done with these institutions. We work, work with libraries, historical societies, nonprofits, some for-profit corporations to do digitization work all across the state. Um, we also work with a variety of academic institutions, um, including IU Indianapolis, um, and who we have had a very good and long-standing relationship with in terms of digitizing materials and the Indianapolis Public Library, county libraries across the state, and we also um, have worked with, um, you know, local communities. We've often done scanathons where we've gone out to local communities, um, like the Bethel AME Church up in Zionsville. People will bring their local records, you know, family records. Those are really powerful experiences because oftentimes these people know their communities far better than you do because you're not from there. Um, and so they bring a lot of that institutional and cultural memory that um, alongside just the digitized items, which is, I think, one of the best parts of my job. So this is the new Indiana Memory website. Um, and we have improved the search tools immensely. So we have a really nice advanced search tool where you can do va faceted searching. Um, and then we also have different uh, resources available on the home page, including access to the Internet Archive and Collections Across Indiana, and then our statewide digital newspaper program, which I'll talk about here in a minute. So when you, when you search for something, um, this, you'll get, these are your search results. Um, so you can sort them by institution, time period, um, subjects. Um, and the subjects are done in concordance with either the Library of Congress's authority headings or the Art and Architecture Thesaurus. Those are the two main digital, um, uh, uh, digital catalogs that we use to standardize um, our, our subjects. And so this was a search for Henry Knox, um, who was uh, Secretary of War at the very beginning, um, the early Republic period. And, but he was also involved in the, what was the Indiana Territory. Um, before Indiana became a state in 1816, it was a part of the Northwest Territory. And after 1803, when Ohio became a state, it became the Indiana Territory. So he was involved with that. And that's what a lot of these, um, these materials are from. So when you either click on the direct link or you click on the thumbnail from the Indian Memory website, it'll take you directly to an image. Um, this is one of my favorite ones. This is an image from uh, the Oakwood Hotel in Lake Wawasee, which is in Syracuse, Indiana. And ContentDM has worked very hard over the last few years to improve their user experience. Um, and one thing that they've done is really improve the zoom function on the, uh, on the access page. So you can click that little uh, sort of blue box that's in the upper right-hand corner of the image, and it gives you a much nicer zoom. And then, of course, with your mouse or trackpad, you can go even farther. 
And when you zoom in on this image, you, you see some things that are actually pretty fun. Um, so you have a couple people on the slide, there's a couple people in the boat, they're kind of rowing. But my favorite person in this picture is actually this guy on the far right, who's just kind of standing there and he's very stern. And I'm like, I wonder if he was, is he even the manager? Was he the owner? He certainly wasn't a lifeguard because he wasn't dressed for it. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so that's kind of what it looks like um, as we zoom in. And, uh, and of course, you also have the metadata, which is almost as important, if not more important, than the digitized image itself. So um, it's a little harder to see here, but we have standardized our metadata to conform with the Digital Public Library of America's standards, especially regarding right statements. Um, we use rightstatements.org for all copyrighted, all copyright-related uh, metadata. Um, and so this one in particular um, is in copyright, but it's educational use permitted. Um, so we've worked with institutions who have been interested in doing digitization work, um, especially newspapers and other institutions um, who have copyright materials, but they own the copyright, and they provide us permission to do that, uh, to do the digitization work. And so this is the kind of information that will often get integrated, not just into the Indiana Memory site, which is sort of a content aggregator. It uses Repox uh, software to do that. Um, but we also use the Digital Public Library of America site. Um, it's an open OAI feed that we connect with D uh, DPLA to get that work done. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about Hoosier State Chronicles, um, which is our statewide digital newspaper program. It grew out of the National Digital Newspaper Program, or Chronicling America, um, which was started in 2004. And the National Digital Newspaper Program grew uh, out of uh, and is a joint venture of the National Endowment for the Humanities and the Library of Congress. But it really grew out of what was called the U.S. Newspaper Program, um, or USNP. And the USNP's job, starting in 1982, was to go around to every, every city in almost every state in the country and find as many newspapers as possible. Newspapers are printed on highly acidic paper, so they essentially turn to dust if you don't take good care of them. So the best way to preserve them, other than digital preservation, is microfilm. Um, we still use microfilm. Um, if, if you've ever used microfilm in your own work or if you've ever seen people like maybe use microfilm on a movie or a TV show, um, microfilm's still big in my business uh, and in my, in, in my field um, because it's still one of the best ways to preserve digitized, uh, or to preserve newspapers, and to preserve documents in general. Um, it's one of the more cost-effective ways, too, because you pay for it once, and you know, it's not like an ongoing cost like it would be with digital preservation. Um, and one fun fact I'll tell people is that when you put things on microfilm, uh, because as you all know, I think probably even better than me, that whole adage that the internet is forever is so not true. Um, if, if you've seen recently, you know, whether it was MTV.com or CMT.com just like pulling their website and pulling all of those news articles and the Internet Archive working tirelessly to get them in the Wayback Machine, you know that stuff can disappear from the Internet pretty quickly. So that's why microfilm is also another really good stopgap measure. And so if you put material on microfilm in the correct formatting and then you put it in the right temperature controlled room, that microfilm can last for 500 years. So it's, it's still another way of doing things. Um, I like to see myself as someone who tries to bridge the gap between the analog and the digital, and that's one way of doing it. So anyway, so with Chronicling America, which is, this is the brand new Chronicling America site. Um, it has newspapers from 1770 to 1963, that's the copyright cutoff. Um, nearly 3,300 titles from all 50 states. We were very happy to get all 50 states. I think Arkansas was our last state to be added to Chronicling America and a couple years ago. But we have all 50 states and two, SU, and two, and two U.S. territories, Puerto Rico and Washington, D.C. And it's at uh, chroniclingamerica.loc.gov. 20 million pages, freely available to you. The other thing that's kind of nice about Chronicling America is that it's an open API, and all the material that's in Chronicling America is in the public domain. So you can, um, you can actually download full batches of images and metadata, and you can either do big data analysis, you can integrate them with Wikipedia collections, so on and so forth, which is pretty cool. 
And like with uh, Indiana Memory, it has you know full page text search, um, and you can also do uh, you can also do uh, faceted search and, and so on. There's also the U.S. Newspaper Directory, um, which is a, also another component of chronicling America, which is super important. Um, and that's basically if you're let's say you're working on a Wikipedia page about say like a politician from like the 1880s or something like that. You need newspapers. You're not quite sure where to go. Um, the directory can take you to titles, and then the directory can even tell you if it's been digitized or not, and it'll take you directly to it. Um, so it's a pretty powerful resource. And Hoosier State Chronicles grew out of our U.S. Uh, of our NDNP work. We started in 2011. I have had the privilege of working on three NDNP cycles in the nearly 10 years I've been in the digitization space. Um, and it's how I got my start, kind of in digital work. Um, it's a real pleasure to be around with all of you. In many ways, you're probably a lot smarter on digital things than, they, than I am, because I thought I was going to work in house museums and give people tours, and I ended up doing this. So I really identified um, uh, with our keynote talking about the butterfly effect. You never quite know where you're going to go. I didn't think I'd be speaking here 10 years ago, so it's a real privilege. Um, but anyway, yeah, so this launched in 2011. Um, and it's our digital platform, much like with Indiana Memory. And just to back up real quick, with Indiana Memory, the kind of stuff we have in it, along state photographs are maps, pamphlets, books, um, postcards, oral histories, um, anything that can pretty much be digitized and is related to cultural heritage, it's in Indiana Memory. But Hoosier State Chronicles is directly related to um, newspapers. And we have nearly 400 titles nearly 1.6 million pages. It's from 1804, so pre-statehood to 2018. Um, and, they're fully and they're fully downloadable as PDFs. They're OCR'd. And we also have fully searchable text, faceted searching. Um, we, use, uh, we have one, a fun project with it, which is our crowdsource optical character recognition text program, where sometimes when the OCR software runs, of course, it's a computer, right? And it's going to on the on the left here, it's going to it kind of generated garbage, and that's for a variety of reasons with newspapers. So, variety of different fonts. You have bleed through from the from the back page of this page, so users can actually create a free account online and go in and correct this text, and it can go from looking like this to looking like this. So those names that weren't searchable before are searchable now, which means they'll end up being picked up by Google too. And we also have other newspapers on Indiana memory through our content DM collections. Let's talk about Wikipedia now. So we got our start working with Wikipedia and Wikimedia Commons largely through our involvement with the Digital Public Library of America. We started working with DPLA towards its beginning um, in 2016. And we were very excited about the opportunity of taking what the work that we had done with Wikipedia and expanding it, or D DPLA, and expanding that into Wikipedia. Um, and I've worked with a lot of really wonderful folks, three of whom are in this room, um, to kind of do this work. Um, and so we've done integration with Wikipedia and Wikimedia Commons in a variety of different ways. One is harvesting material from Indiana Memory and DPLA. So materials that we've added into DPLA, it's about a quarter of a million items of the 700,000 that are in Indiana Memory, have been integrated into Wikipedia. Um, and they're all in the public domain. So DPLA will only harvest things, excuse me, that are um, in the public domain or without any form of copyright so that once they are all then harvested for Wikipedia, um, then they're freely usable. And it's not just images, like it's a lot of text-based stuff too. Um, so a lot, of, a lot of books and pamphlets that we've digitized through our, through our Indiana memory collections are also there too. And so, you know, we've worked with sort of um, developing those relationships with cultural heritage institutions to do this kind of work. So that's IU Indianapolis, DPLA, the Indianapolis Public Library, county libraries across the state and so on, and really building those uh, relationships, um, which I've been, I think, some of the most rewarding of my professional life and ones that I think have really improved um, our digital collections and our digital uh, projects for the state in general. 
And so we've also provided editors with scholarly uh, secondary research on Untold Indiana, which is the Indiana Historical Bureau's blog. I work for the division of the library that's the Historical Bureau. We manage the State Historical Marker Program. So if you've, as, if you, as you've wandered through Indianapolis over the weekend or the last few days, you've probably seen some of those big blue and gold plaques and signs that tell you a little bit about Indiana history. We manage that program. And so, um, but we also have a blog, and all of us who write for the blog are professional historians who are trained in primary source research, and we uh, create, you know, rigorous scholarly work that shows up on our blog that has been cited on um, Indiana history pages and other pages related to history um, on Wikipedia as well. And we've hosted virtual and in-person events. So to date, we have over 267,000 items that have been added through Indiana Memory and DPLA, which has totaled into 22 million views as of May of 2024. And that's basically over two years, which is pretty exceptional. So to give you some background, you know, monthly, the Indiana Memory site will maybe get 60 to 80,000 hits. And the Hoosier State Chronicles site um, will get maybe 100 to 150,000 hits a month. Um, but once I started seeing the analytics, I think my jaw hit the floor. I was like thrilled that people were seeing this work and, and that it was being integrated in such an effective way into Wikipedia. So this is an example. Um, so this is the Senate Avenue YMCA. Um, so the Senate Avenue YMCA which was established in 1912, was an historically African-American YMCA here in the city. And this page was worked on by a college student who reached out to us and said, hey, how can we improve this page? Well, one of the ways that they improved this page was through the references and so, um, and through the historical marker images that we've put up there, because we've done a state historical marker for the Senate Avenue YMCA. And so we um, have a, uh, a we basically have a database and we're working on a digital collection of all of our markers across the state. These were images of the Senate Avenue YMCA marker. And so he reached out to us and said, hey, can we get these on Wikipedia? And we said, sure. Because the other component of this work that we do alongside the stuff with DPLA is the stuff we put in manually. Um, and so, and we as the Bureau, we own the rights to these images, so we're happy to put them up with a Creative Commons license. Um, and so this has been one way that we've been improving Wikipedia is through um, documenting historical markers and historical research that we've done related to pages on the site, which is pretty, uh, it's been fairly rewarding to see. And we've hosted a variety of events over the last seven years. Um, and I also want to say, and I feel like I kind of buried the lead here, but um, my colleague Joey Simmons at the Indiana Historical Bureau has been a big part of the work that we've done with Wikipedia. This program was put together with her, um, and uh, but she, <laughs> she was at basically two conferences this weekend, so that's why it's just me today. Um, but, uh, but her work was really indispensable in building those professional relationships with DPLA, Wikipedia, and um, with other cultural heritage organizations across the state. So this was an incredible event. It was hosted in conjunction with Indiana Humanities. And uh, it was uh, Hoosier Women in STEM. Uh, and it was in conjunction with the Hoosier Women at Work History Conference, which some of you may have gone to yesterday. It was at the Kurt Vonnegut Museum. And so we, there were 870 edits across 99 articles, and injuries included notable women such as Frances Exton and Cora Barbara Hennel. This is the Frances Exton page, and uh, she was the founder of the physical therapy program at the IU School of Medicine. Um, one fact that, uh, that blew my mind when I learned it, um, and I think it's still fairly accurate, but correct me if I'm wrong, is that of the biographical, information that's on Wikipedia, about 20% of it is devoted to women. And so the goal of this event and many other events that we've had uh, has been to sort of change that and make that um, inequality in the biographical information on women um, better and to make it more pair, you know, make it, make it, make it more equal, right? Because women aren't 20% of the population, <laughs> you know, they're 50, right? Or sometimes more. The other person that we did was um, Cora Barbara Hennel. And this was an image from one of our digital collections as well. Um, and uh, she was a mathematician. 
In 2023, we did the Wiki Loves Pride event. Um, I think that's where I met Jamie for the first time, um, who was wonderful, and Jerry was there, and I think Olivia was there too. And, and we had a really wonderful time. We had nine attendees, and we created or edited a wide variety of pages related to Indiana's LGBTQ history. And we also added images to pages via Indiana Memory and DPLA. Um, and the one page that I worked on that day, so here's one that we kind of worked on that day, which is the Indianapolis Men's Chorus. Um, the Indianapolis Men's Chorus um, is a incredible nonprofit made up of wonderful choral singers from the LGBTQ community in the city. We've also done a po an episode of our podcast, Talking Hoosier History, about the Indianapolis Men's Chorus and the um, and the bigotry and discrimination that they faced in the early 1990s and how they persevered through it. And then when I was there that day, you know, I'm, I'm in many ways still very much a novice when it comes to Wikipedia. I wear a lot of hats at the State Library, so unfortunately I don't always get as much time to do Wikipedia work as I'd love to. But this is one that I sort of kind of worked on and I need to go back to. And it's, an, it's a writer named Randy Boyd who was from Indiana. And um, he's an African-American, uh, um, uh, he's an African-American gay writer um, who was HIV positive, who is HIV positive, and has written about his experiences growing up in Indiana and, and sort of the, the, the various forms of discrimination that he faced. Um, and so his page was sort of created, but there really wasn't anything there. So my goal was to try to find the best secondary work I could on him. Um, and then I also built out his, um, his, like, his bibliography page. Um, so, you know, I'm, I really love literature. I'm really big into books. So I'm a lot on the book section of Wikipedia. And I love the way that the bibliography is laid out for authors. And so I kind of created one for him based on his major works. Um, and so this is a site that needs to go back. I basically, I, I think it's one of those where they basically say they don't, they don't know if he's important enough or it's relevant enough, but my hope is to go back to this page one day and do more work because I actually do think that he was an indispensable voice, not to mention the fact that he also set up his own publishing firm to publish LGBTQ work that wouldn't be published otherwise, um, which I think is pretty exceptional too. And I think he lives out in California these days. And then last year, we did the Hoosier Women at Work Wikipedia Edit-a-thon um, that had 25 attendees, and we provided a full tutorial on Wikipedia editing, thanks to Jamie. And uh, we focused on women's history, similar to our 2017 event. And it was kind of at this event that I, f I found what I really love to do, which is, I know it's like surprising, considering I deal with the digital images all day. My favorite thing to do with Wikipedia is find images from our collections and integrate them into pages. So that's what I did. I found a variety of different images of, uh, related to women's history and I sort of got them on Wikipedia. So in the event that people are like, we're gonna create a page about this person, they don't have to reinvent the wheel. They can just go to Wikimedia Commons, find the image of it and put it online with the page when they, when they go and create it. So here are some pages that we edited. So this is Flossie Bailey, um, who was an activist. She was very instrumental in trying to pass uh, a federal lynching law in the 1930s after the horrific lynching that happened uh, in Marion, Indiana in 1930, 1931, somewhere around that. And so she was an activist uh, and, and a prominent African-American citizen of Indianapolis, and she sort of led her own crusade against lynching in the 1930s, um, which is why her, her, um, her, uh, her page is so important. And the picture of her is from the Indianapolis Recorder, um, which is the historic African-American newspaper in the city, which is still published today. And you can see that picture on Hoosier State Chronicles. So that's another page that we helped improve through our digital collections. Another one is Mary Stewart Edwards, um, who was a suffragist and social reformer from my home, my old hometown of Peru, Indiana. And so some of these other images that are on the site are also from our digital collections page. Um, and so we worked with historians and Wikipedians during that incredible event to improve these pages to show the wide diversity of history from uh, women's history from Indiana. And the last one I'll tell you about happened this year. It was our Wikipedia edit-a-thon for librarians, which we had in May. And we had 13 attendees, and we gave an overview of getting started on Wikipedia editing. Um, and this one was mostly for librarians. Um, this one was, as the name implies, and we had a lot of internal staff at the State Library who were very enthusiastic and really engaged in like 
getting this work done and doing really interesting stuff. And so we edited pages and added images. So here's an example of one that I worked on. This one's really interesting to me. So this is the Riverside Amusement Park, um, which was an amusement park from 1903 to 1970. This is a page that didn't have any pictures on it, like at all. And so I went to Hoosier State Chronicles, as I often do, because I love newspapers, and I found a 1928 article about the Riverside Amusement Park that not just had pictures of the park itself, but also had pictures of staff. So these were the managers of the Riverside Amusement Park in 1928. And I, so I put their names there, and then I also provided the links. As you well know, you guys are pretty well-versed Wikipedians, but I was really thrilled. And someone, a user who, who edits local history pages, reached out to me and was just like, thank you so much for doing that. Um, and, uh, and if you know me, you know, I've lived in Indiana my whole life, who's your, who's your hospitality thing? A thank you goes a long way to me. So for someone to take the time out of their day to thank me for making this page a little bit more dynamic by adding these images, um, really meant the world to me. And so in closing, I just want to say that I'm really, really thrilled and proud of the work that we've done to enhance our digital collections through Wikipedia and Wikimedia Commons. Um, you, your, your group is one of the most inclusive and engaged and, and, and enthusiastic groups that I've worked with in the years I've been in the digital space. And I can't thank you enough um, for being here today to learn a little bit more about how we've tried to improve Hoosier history online. Thank you so much. We can open it up for questions. Uh, not to be too open-ended, but what's next? What's your wish, <laughs> dream list of things we can work on with you? Ooh, good question. So um, I was actually talking about this a little bit with Jamie um, earlier today. So the Library of Congress, especially through Chronicling America, is starting to, to really emphasize environmental history and agricultural history. Um, you know, um, as you guys have noticed over the last three days, it's been like in the low 80s in October. <laughs> so, you know, like, um, I think that what we've tried to do through these projects is, is to share the wide diversity, whether it's LGBTQ history, women's history, African American history, but we need to do a better job with talking about the climate because it is a true crisis. And, you know, climate change is real, it's, it's a problem. And through, whether it's um, soil surveys, that's what Jeremy, Jamie and I were talking about, or newspaper articles about you know, crop yields and potential weather reports, almanacs, these are all the materials to give us that sort of long-term picture of what's going on with our climate. And so that's the one thing I would say is, one thing I'd really like to do in the future is do maybe an edathon related to environmental history and science history. Um, that would improve the, that kind of material related to Indiana and to just like the United States in general. So that would be like, I think the next thing I'd really like to do. I just wanted to say thanks, Justin. And uh, one of the things I wanted to add to that, um, a couple things I wanted to add. Justin and Jill and the State Library as a whole are some of our most, um, prolific and supportive uh, collaborators. Uh, they're part of why we're here. Uh, and so definitely thank you for that. And then one of the really cool things is our Wikipedia for Librarians uh, session that actually gave the librarians that attended uh, continuing education credits. In the state of Indiana, you have to get so many LEUs each year, and we were able to offer them four for that presentation. And it was really great to learn that, and we can do that again at any time. And so I think that's really wonderful. I'm, I'm with Jason, I'm looking forward to doing more about climate and soil surveys. Uh, part of my work is in environmental justice, and so I'm hoping, and we have done a program before on environmental justice in Indiana, um, because environmental issues, climate issues, environmental justice issues, those are truly everywhere. They're not just an urban issue, they're not just an, a rural issue, they affect everyone. Um, and so thanks for mentioning that and thanks for being here, Justin. Oh, thank you, Jamie. <laughs> I appreciate it very much. And yeah, I think that's true. I mean, I think that, you know, we, we as a community are 
very dedicated to being a, a sort of, not just historians or, or librarians, but to be advocates, advocates for libraries, advocates for history, and advocates for digital collections and digital advocacy. Um, uh, I, I feel very strongly about um, digital humanism, that I think there's a way for us to create digital collections that can not just uh, educate us, but that can inspire us and that can improve our lives, um, which I, I ultimately I think that's what we do, um, you know, and as somebody who, you know, I'm sort of, a, I guess, the middle millennial or whatever, you know, like, I was a little kid when Wikipedia started, and so I, I, can't, I can't really remember my life without it. And, you know, for me, like, when I'm searching anything, the first place I want to go is Wikipedia. Like, if I type it in Google, I don't want to see the Gemini AI garbage. I don't want to see that. I don't want to see other junk or ads. I want to see Wikipedia. So, um, and I think that's why we're so committed to it, because I deeply care about Wikipedia. I think, to me, Wikipedia and the Internet Archive are really the two largest institutions that keep the idea of a digital commons alive. Um, we live in an age where, you know, we have, in my opinion, you know, very large tech corporations that have created walled gardens. And Wikipedia and the Internet Archive are not that. And I think keeping that, that alive is crucial to um, the future of digital humanities. So thank you, Jamie, very, very much. I really appreciate your guys' help. Jerry O'Dell, Olivia Mac Isaac, Dominic Bird McDivitt. I would not be here without Dominic. He was the biggest champion for this. He was the one who convinced me um, that it was the right thing to do. And, uh, and I'm, so, I'm so glad I listened to him. So we got a little more time if anybody has questions. I'm happy to answer more stuff. Uh, my name's Jerry O'Dell, and I've had a lot of pleasure of working with you. So you and Jill are some of the hardest working people I know. <laughs> Thank you. And you guys too. I cite your blog and some of your other works frequently while editing about Indiana topics. So. Thank you so much for the secondary sources. Um, so yeah, to the hard work piece, um, I was chatting with Colby, who's sitting over here the other day, and he said, we need to make more fun. So <laughs> I'm just going to take this opportunity in front of everyone to say, how can Wikimedians of Indiana have more fun since we've been just working so hard lately? <laughs> That's a great question. So um, I think one of the ways that we've had a lot of fun has been hosting the social events. So we hosted the Friday evening reception at the State Library, and that was really super fun. And I really appreciate everybody who came out, who had a good time, who volunteered. Um, so I think doing more social events too, where we can, the wikithons can turn into, hey, let's go get, you know, let's go get dinner, you know, or something like that. Um, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I don't know, like, it, it, this is where, like, I, my own limitations are at play here, because, like, I, I don't, I'm, I'm, like, kind of like an old man stuck in a young man's body, like, I like crosswords and peppermints and being in my recliner, so, like, it's, it's, you know, I'm not always, like, the most fun guy on the planet, but I really do feel like having those social engagements mixed with doing the, the work would be really, really fun, so if we do wiki edit thons where one of the wiki edit thons we had pizza, and, and, you know, it was really fun to hang out and learn from other people, but yeah, I think just doing like social events where, you know, you get together and maybe play duck pen bowling down in Fountain Square or, um, you know, maybe go to a local branch of the library and, and learn about something, you know, or go to Crown Hill, do a tour of Crown Hill Cemetery. Um, I know the director there very well, Ginny Regan Dinius, who was at Hoosier Women at Work yesterday. I've known her for years. Um, you know, but doing those kinds of like cultural events that can then be used as sort of the inspiration for doing Wikipedia pages, right? So like, I know that there are a ton of Indiana politicians who are, who are influential in their time who do not have Wikipedia pages. Or if they do, they're, they're, kind, of lim they, they're kind of small, right? Uh, half of them are buried at Crown Hill Cemetery. <laughs> so like you could just go to Crown Hill Cemetery and maybe see the grave of you know, Samuel Ralston or something um, and go, okay, now I'm inspired to do something about that. So I think doing cultural events, you know, dinners, fun things, that's the way of kind of inspiring the work um, and keeping the work going. Great question, Jerry, thank you. Do you let everyone know what, why Crown Hill is 
Yes, so Crown Hill is the big cemetery here in Indianapolis. Some of the most famous people of Indiana are buried there. It's also a Civil War cemetery um, where both Union and Confederate soldiers are buried. Um, that is where Benjamin Harrison is buried, who was the only president um, elected from the state of Indiana. That's where Carl Fisher is, who is one of the founders of the Indianapolis 500. Um, I'm pretty sure uh, that a lot of the writers of the Indiana, the Hoosier Renaissance of the early 20th century, so like Meredith Nicholson, George Ade, James Wickham Riley, a lot of them were buried there, buried close. Um, James Wickham Riley is the Hoosier poet. He came up with Little Orphan Annie. Um, and so, yeah. Al Capone, <laughs> yeah, I yeah, wrote about that too. Um, and so um, a lot of famous people are buried in Crown Hill Cemetery. So it's a way of maybe going there and seeing some interesting figures and learning about like, oh, well, who's that? And you look it up on Wikipedia and maybe that page is long and maybe it's short. And you're like, okay, that would be a good topic to maybe do more research on. Um, you know, I do a lot of political history research in, in my day job with the Bureau. Um, so that's kind of my focus of political history, intellectual history. Um, and uh, and I, I don't think I could have done the research I did without starting points of Wikipedia. That's what I always tell people. Like when people are like, oh, you can't cite Wikipedia. It's like, maybe you can't cite Wikipedia, but you certainly can cite the things that it cites. You know, so yeah, definitely. But Crown Hill's a fun place to go um, if you like cemeteries. If you don't like that thing, I don't want to make you scared, but it's a fun place to be if you like being walking around with, with a bunch of dead people in the ground. <laughs> yeah. Um, Pro-life tip on the previous question, just throw in some pizzas and then it's a fun event. <laughs> uh, but for my question, um, this is more niche and on the technical side, but yeah. you have mentioned briefly the OCR you've been working mm -hmm. on and crowdsourcing. And yes. that really caught my attention because sure. I'm also working on a really large scale OCR project and we wanted to bring in people and pay them like a little money to have them review that, but it will actually cost a lot of money and it's a Wikipedia project because oh. that's a ton of words. Okay. Uh, so I was curious, like, how well did the crowdsourcing work? Yeah. How many people are you actually getting? Is it actually effective? Like, whatever you can share about it. Yeah, sure. That's a great question. So the way that the process works, when we do newspaper digitization, um, we, uh, it's such a, it's a, such a huge task because with collections that are in Indiana memory, you know, people can do that on their own. They can upload the images, they can do the metadata kind of all in one go. Newspapers are really different. They're kind of a different baby. So it's very much like a metadata tree where you have like a batch, which is like 10,000 pages. And in the batch, then you have microfilm reels and on the reels are about 750 images. And then out of that are issues and then pages. So there's metadata for each parts of that chain. And the page metadata includes the OCR. And that's all done by, of course, by computer software. Um, I think they, I think our latest vendor used, I think, Abby to do that work. Mm -hmm. And so the, the uh, crowdsourcing project has been really popular for a variety of reasons. One, for people who just find it kind of interesting. Um, for two, I mean, I think a lot of us in this room like things that are oddly satisfying. So like when you go through a column, then you can hit save. Is this column completely edited? Yes, you can check a little box and save it. That's very satisfying. Um, we don't offer any money for it, but one thing that we do offer that's kind of like a fun thing is that the top five editors are displayed on our page. Um, and so, you know, if you do enough work on it, um, you can have that. It's also a really good project for like, let's say you're finding like an intern or like a student volunteer or like somebody who wants to kind of get in this space and learn how to do something. It's great to do that. I've worked with students. I've written them, you know, letters of commendation for their work on it. Um, yeah. So it's, it's pretty successful. I mean, we've, over the last, you know, 13 years, we've done thousands of edits across probably hundreds of, of folks. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I think it's fairly successful. One thing I'd like to do eventually in the future is figure out ways to improve the OCR on site, perhaps using some form of a large language model that can go in and clean it up. Um, but that's really the trouble with newspapers is like I showed you like the different fonts you bleed through, like those are the kind of the challenges. Um, but yeah, I think it's overall, the, the crowdsourcing project's been super fun and and people have really enjoyed it. and. And, uh, and yeah, that's, so that's what I'd recommend for you is like, you know, if you, know, if you want to get graduate students, you know, high school students, college students, and then, you know, if it's like a particular project, they might get credit for it or whatever. And then um, you can also write them like a letter of recommendation. So like you can say, hey, they did this great work. Here's how they did it. And then, um, so I've done that for a few different students. So that's kind of my experience with it.
Thank uh, you. That's great. Uh, quick follow up. Sure. Uh, there are ways that we're also exploring with LLMs and other tools to actually uh, deal with the formatting. So let's awesome. talk about that after perhaps. Yes, I'd love uh, to. Yeah. Maybe to be more specific, my question, because we're sort of time limited on what we're doing. How long do you feel like or do you estimate it will take, like roughly, depending just on those volunteers Ooh. to proofread a whole OCR? Yeah, yeah. so uh, it would be never be done. Yeah, I mean, so, so yeah. to give you a sense of it, so we have 1.6 million pages across 214 years. And that's over 700 titles. And oh, wow. each title, so like a daily page, like let's say it's the Indianapolis News, that can be 20 pages. And that's not just 20 pages, it's 20 pages of multiple columns, right? So that's, yeah, it's a work that would essentially never be done completely unless there was like some kind of machine learning or AI built into it. Yeah. Good question. Thank you. No problem. Thank you. Hi. Curiosity question. Yeah. So I worked on a, uh, a page of, for a, an article for a 19th century Indian artist by the name of uh, uh, Wilbur Woodrow. Okay. And, uh, you know, award-winning uh, uh, artist who died young. Um, and it became obvious that most of the images uh, around that are actually copies of his work. And I re realized that other, other than the one copy that's in the Indiana uh, Art Museum, um, most of his work is in private hands. And I was wondering if you had any strategy for, say, for reaching out to fellow citizens and saying, hey, you know, there, we, we're looking for... Um, you know, people who have these works in their, you know, possession so that we can, like, photograph them. I was wondering if there's yeah. any strategy for that. That's a great question. Thank you. So one way that we've tried to do that kind of work is through our scanathons. So we've done scanathons before. Another or an incredible organization that, done, that does excellent digitization work in scanathons is called Indiana Album. It's run by my good friend and colleague, Joan Hostetler. And they just go to communities and they say, bring out what you have. And if you have really unique stuff, we'll do it. And the way it works is people can bring it out. Um, they sign a release form that provides Indian Album or us with permission to share it online, but they retain the rights. Um, and then we make it available online. That might be an avenue of going forward with it. Or at the very least, um, and then sometimes it's just even one-on-one. -on -one. So uh, I've been involved since its beginning with an organization called the Indiana Entertainment Foundation. And one of the people who's deeply involved with that has some of the most valuable memorabilia related to rock music in the world. So he has like Beatles stuff, he has Elvis stuff, he has Michael Jackson stuff. Um, and when he's interested in doing digitization, we've worked with him one-on-one -on -one to like bring stuff into the library, we scan it, and then we put it in their, in their digital collections. Um, so it's kind of two different approaches. Either it's more of like a net approach where you do like a scanathon, people come to you, or if you kind of know where things are, you kind of reach out to people um, and set up meetings, kind of let them know how the process goes, and then and then we do the we either do the work or we send it out to a vendor um, to do the scanning, and then we work on the metadata. So those are the kind of couple different ways that I've I've done that kind of work. Okay. Thank you. You're quite welcome. Thank you so much. We might have time for one more. Oh, one minute. One minute. All right. Well, we can end it there. I want to thank you all so much for being here. I really, really appreciate it to sit here and listen to me talk about Indiana Collections on a Sunday. So thank you guys so much. It's been a lot of fun. Have a great rest of your day.